Hello and welcome to Artifacts. Uh, later on we're going to be talking with some writers who are going to tell us what uh, clinch covers and bodice rippers and what the romantic fiction scene is all about here in the Twin Cities. Also, the Minnesota film and video industry has been breaking down barriers between government and business. Uh, and they've been forming a new partnership of sorts with none other than the IRS. You'll find out why nobody's singing the 1040 blues. <laughs> and later on, we're going to meet some folks from the Sheridan Arts Magnet School in Northeast Minneapolis. And we're also going to take a sneak preview at America Japan Week, which is going to be in the Twin Cities here uh, over the Memorial Day weekend. Plus, movies, prizes, and probably some surprises. Hang with us for Artifacts. And we're very excited with this edition of Artifacts to uh, start some new features here. Most of all, I'd like to welcome Janet Zahn. Those of you who've mm -hmm. been in uh, the city of Minneapolis watching City Cable 34, you've been lucky enough to see her for the last few years mm -hmm. as the host and producer of, uh, producer of Sound Image, a show that's taken a look at the film, video, and recording industries here in the Minneapolis area. And with this edition of Artifacts, she's joining us as a co-host and producer of segments that relate to those industries. That's so, right. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Phil. And she's bringing her considerable talents to the show. Um, and we're looking forward to some new segments as the year goes on. Um, we're talking about maybe having more frequent um, new episodes. We're talking about going on location more, adding a little bit of fun, and of course emphasizing the film and uh, recording industry. So mm -hmm. look forward to some changes here in Artifacts. Now, I'm very excited to have uh, as our first guest in this segment three writers that I've been talking with uh, a little bit as we've been ready to tape and also talking with one of them for some months about having people on here. But before we get to know them, let's start with a reading from one of them, and then we'll introduce them to you. What did she want, Sarah wondered. What did people wish for? She used to want a little sister, but Mom wouldn't go for that at this point in her life. Other than lack of siblings, she had almost everything she desired. A home, a wonderful family, a nice butt. She was employed and doing just fine. She supposed she could wish to be the greatest guitarist in the world, but somehow that seemed like cheating. Did she really believe this stuff? No, but there was no harm in wishing. Start with something traditional, Mala suggested. Wish for what, Sarah questioned, to find my own true love? As the words were spoken, the voice she'd heard earlier insinuated itself into her mind, sounding bored and sarcastic. I knew that would be next. What? What? Mala echoed. The sound rang in Sarah's head as the pain from the bump suddenly became sharply intense. She heard a voice whispering just on the edge of hearing, yet insistent enough to drown out the sounds outside the little tent. She saw faces looming up out of nowhere, a black cat, a blue-eyed fox, a stunningly attractive man. The images blended until the human one filled her mind. She could clearly made out, make out a triangle of sharp chin and high cheekbones below a wing of night black hair held out of the eyes by a wide red headband. Eyes, brilliant, intelligent blue eyes, sooty lidded, up-tilted, framed by heavy black lashes. He sought, soft-footed as a cat, wily as a fox, something, someone, her, huh? What? Why on earth was the tent spinning at warp 10? Who was calling her? Why did it sound so far away? Someone nearby said, stay here, I'll get the medics. Stay here. She couldn't move. She'd hit her head. She just hit her head, dizzy. It felt as if someone were sucking on her toes. She liked it. It felt as if gravity were getting very fresh with her, pulling her. Where was she going? The citrine twinkled. She could feel it twinkle. How about, it suggested stonily, 1811. I like that gravity part sucking on the toes. That was Susan <laughs> Sizemore reading from her book, My Own True Love. And thank you very much for coming and reading and joining us. We've got Connie Brockway, thank you, another author here in the Twin Cities, and Denise Meadstad, who's an author in the Twin Cities area. And let's get the genre correct. I think generally people would think of this as romance fiction. Is that a good way to characterize it? That's what I write. That's what you write, yeah. okay. Um, and you two are published authors. Yes. Okay. Newly published. Newly published. On my third. You're on your third oh, book. Yes. And you've just had one come out? Two weeks ago. I think you've got the book here. Let's take yes. a look at it. Yes. Promise me heaven. Okay. Mmm. Looks good. Um, while you're holding it there, what kind of a cover is that? It's um, a clinch. <laughs> a clinch. Now, is that a heavy or a light clinch? That's a light clinch. That's light. Yeah. His hands are not anywhere they're not supposed to be. And you would care if your kid saw it. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's part of the distinction. And now we're going to get into talking about the writing and the publishing and all this and that, but I think it's fair to say that mm -hmm. most people, when, if they're not familiar with the genre, the first thing they see, I mean the visual thing that grabs them are these covers. Um, 
Do you guys have anything to do with these covers? No. No. We, <laughs> that's well, not that's true, not exactly. True. We do get to fill out um, art sheets. They ask us questions like, what, what color is your hero's hair? What color is your heroine's hair? And um, occasionally they'll even ask you, what scene do you like in your book? Oh, that's Susan got Yes. Yeah. Uh, the cover of uh, My Own True Love. Actually, I had no input on this cover, and yet the artist read the book and did one of my favorite scenes. That's actually a scene from the book. So I was really pleased with it because the cover is a scene from the book. Often Which, they're not. Often they're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, what's the reason? What's the reason for covers like this? I mean, this is this it identifies. Is, oh, it certainly me. no. It true. identifies them as being romance novels. Why mm -hmm. does a mystery have a certain type of cover? Why does a western have a certain type of cover? Why does a science fiction genre books have certain types of covers to identify them as what they are? They are genre fiction. Mm -hmm. Before when we were going through before, yeah. and we were able to just toss out three books <laughs> as non-rom books, and as not part of the initiated, I brought some books over to say, now talk to us about these news. That's, that cover just signifies it's not uh, a cover. Now this, this is a little racier. When I held this up to you before, you indicated that this is what kind? <laughs> <laughs> heavy clench. Heavy, heavy. And what distinguishes this from a light clench? Well, she looks a little more in pain. <laughs> yes. Oh. He looks a little more intent, and she's falling out of her clothes. I see. Uh, okay. And, and the hands uh, have anything to do with this? Well, yeah, his hand is getting a little bit towards those. Towards the zones there. <laughs> okay. Will this, this sell more books, fewer books? It'll I sell to people who are looking for that. That is indicative of the, the type or the extent of graphic oh, um, okay. sexuality or sensuality in the book, mm -hmm. then yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I showed this to you, and you said this is old. Is that right? No, no not that that's one. That's new. Not it's this new one. Oh, this is a new one. Okay. Yes. All right, and that's just a typical one. Now, this comes. This is a subgenre here because of the. <laughs> that's an older book too. And it's an older. Yes. Book. I should have looked in here. <laughs> but uh, given the the dress here of the characters as they're depicted, this they puts would it in. They would say that it would be a, from the from the house in the background and what they're wearing. We would say that would be, take place in the 1700s. Okay, so to, so to some extent, book. this works to your favor, depending on what you're writing. If they put a meaningful cover on here. Now, I call this the, a training book because <laughs> I thought this was a book that got people involved here at a younger age, but you said, no, that's not true. No, it's just an old that's book. An older book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure it's a fine book indeed. Um, and I held this one up and all three of these writers just, they made a noise. <laughs> and it wasn't that noise either. Now, what was it about this book that... That's an older type of book. Rosemary Rogers uh, wrote these, what was from the 70s, very popular part of the genre called the Sweet Savage. It involved, uh, well, rape fiction. Mm. And so it's not something that I would write and very few people write anymore. And I don't, Rosemary Rogers very doesn't even write it anymore, I don't believe. No. Okay. So it's very politically incorrect. So this, this went a little bit beyond racy into kind of questionable. It was sort of yes. like, it, you can do anything you want, I'm not responsible. See, when I'm on at the airport and I see a range of these covers, I'm, I just don't have the eyes to see the difference. So thank you for that little walkthrough. Mm -hmm. But Enough of the, the lurid covers. Let's talk about what got you all into this. Now, Denise, um, you're a writer but unpublished right now. What mm -hmm. got you into writing this genre of, of fiction? Well, I started writing when I was 13. And as I got older, I just got more, more into reading. And I think I was probably about 23 when I read my first romance novel. It was called um, The One by lot, Kathleen Woodoise. <laughs> the One by Kathleen Woodoise, um, Flame in the Flower. Oh. I read that one. That was mm -hmm. my very first, and I was obsessed with them after that, and so that's when I started writing them. What caused you to become obsessed? What was it that hooked you? The emotion. Mm -hmm. I really loved the emotion in the books. Mm -hmm. hmm. Connie, what got I, you into this? I always wrote. I always wrote since I was a little, little girl, and I have a degree in English with a creative writing core from McAllister College. Why I write romances, I love the genre. The genre I'm, the idea or the concept of romance, of someone going on a quest or being willing to put it all on the line for someone else is, you know, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that's why I write them and that's why I read them. Mm -hmm. Susan, who, who's the main audience? Who reads most of these books? Women. Mostly women. It is a woman's job. Women write for women. Okay, so mostly women For the writers. most part, I mean, they're... Hmm? Mostly women as writers. Most, mostly well. women, not completely, but mostly. Yeah. And the audience is a core female audience. Okay. Now, who? What's it like to get into the publishing? Here, you've been. Some of you've been writing since you were very young. How long had you been writing? Oh, I've been writing all my life. All your life. Um, 
how did it, what did it take to break into publishing? Who, who discovered you or what doors did you knock on? Well, I, I didn't, I had a very, very easy route. Um, I happened, I think I was on the right place at the right time. I wrote this book, it took me a year, and I found an agent and she was able to sell the first book I wrote. Mm. Um, that is not the usual not story. Typical. I would say that's not even fair, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's great, congratulations. Well, thank you, but it, yeah. it's, um, I'm sure I'm gonna end up paying my dues in rewrites. <laughs> so. Okay, great. Um, Booksellers. I mean, uh, anybody have a figure for how many of these books sell? I mean, how oh, big yeah. an industry is this? Well, we have, what, 40%? 40 46. 46 percent of the market. Wow. Most books sold are romances. Mass market. Incredible. Mass market. Mm -hmm. Incredible. $750 million worth of uh, revenue last year alone. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's going up figures by all accounts are going up in the wrong. So I would assume then that booksellers love the genre. It moves, or are, are, is there a, a difference between booksellers? Are different booksellers stronger or weaker in promoting your books in particular? Well, B. Dalton's pretty good about that. They have their heart-to-heart -heart newsletter. And Walden's has And too. Walden's. Okay. But, you, you know, like any the, other... The independent uh, booksellers uh, are very good about um, helping with promotions and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of which, you two each have a new book out, what, this month that yes. this show is airing. And you're signing somewhere? Where is that and when? Many places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, places. <laughs> Turn around, we'll be there. <laughs> yeah, so it's like all of February is going to be spent signing books. Mm -hmm. I told my editor yesterday I was going on tour. Um, <laughs> Seven months. To support the new album. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will be at City Center on the 14th. 14th. 14th of February, which is at noon. kind of a key date, I would think. Right. Mm. Hopefully. Yes, Denise, hopefully. did you tell me that, that February is. Uh, in informally anyhow the month for this sort of fiction? Well, there's a lot of romance things going on yeah. in the month of February so because it's a month of romance. Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, uh, is there some kind of a support network here in the cities or? There certainly uh, is. Tell us about that. Well, I'm the president at the moment of ah. Midwest Fiction Writers. Mm -hmm. So there is a very large, there's over 100 of us, support group we meet every month, the second Saturday of every month at the Edina Community Center at 1030. And it's published and non-published writers. We're a very strong support group. We have um, critique groups. We have, we're putting on a writers' conference April 22nd to 24th, mm. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can put, uh, I think you gave us a post office box. We can get that up yes. on the screen so Great. people want to get in touch with your organization. Mm -hmm. Great, and what kind of support do you give one another? Is it critiques? Is it uh, help in sort of technically, how do you get, I mean, other than Connie, how do you get to a publisher? <laughs> I mean, you're in the right place. But <laughs> what do you do for each other with this uh, network? Well, we talk to each other constantly. We, <laughs> we give, uh, we have a newsletter, mm -hmm. we have the meetings, we have uh, critique groups, we do workshops, we talk to each other a lot. A lot mm -hmm. of phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> Is that typical, do you think, of people who write other kinds of, or in other yeah. genres? I do. Mm -hmm. I don't see, you know, I, I think um, by nature we're sort of iconoclasts. I mean, we're sitting in basements. By choice, yes. For hours and hours <laughs> alone, <laughs> we don't dress like this normally. <laughs> we come out every few days and really, go, "Oh, you're still alive." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you each about that, uh, Denise. You're, you're writing now, and you've been doing it for a long time. What's mm -hmm. your sort of your daily routine? I mean, is it a matter of you try and get some minutes or hours in every day, or is it a weekend yes. thing, or how do you do it? Yes, every day when I come home from work, the first thing I do is I go into my room. I have a small room. It's about that up yes. on the screen so Great. people want to get in touch yes. with your organization. Mm -hmm. Great. And what kind of support do you give one another? Is it critiques? Is it uh, help in sort of technically how do you get, I mean, other than Connie, how do you get to a publisher? <laughs> I mean, you're in the right place. But <laughs> what do you do for each other with this uh, network? Well, we talk to each other constantly. We, we give, uh, we have a newsletter. Mm -hmm. We have the meetings. We have uh, critique groups. We do workshops. We talk to each other a lot. A lot mm -hmm. of phone calls. Yeah. Is that typical, do you think, of people who write other kinds of, or in other yeah. genres? I do. Mm -hmm. I don't see, you know, I, I think um, by nature we're sort of iconoclasts. I mean, we're sitting in basements by choice. Yes. <laughs> For hours and hours <laughs> alone. <laughs> we don't dress like this normally. <laughs> <laughs> we come out every few days and really, go, oh, you're still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you each about that. Uh, Denise, you're, you're writing now and you've been doing it for a long time. What's mm -hmm. your sort of your daily routine? I mean, is it a matter of you try and get some minutes or hours in every day or is it a yes. weekend thing or how do you do it? Yes. Every day when I come home from work, the first thing I do is I go into my room. I have a small room. It's about White, white carpeting, white walls. It's nice and bright. <laughs> and um, what I do is I turn on the computer, 
then I light a candle and I turn off the light and I sit and I write in the dark with a candle. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when my memory flags or if I'm just getting tired or I can't think, I stare at the candle and that helps me to concentrate. And it has nothing to do with being in a romantic mood or anything like that. It's just really good, really good way to concentrate. And I sit all night and type on my computer and look at the candle. What else and inspires you? Music. Mm -hmm. Music does. Um, sometimes I'll just hear something, like on a TV show, or I'll see an advertisement for something, and a plot right in my head, just like that. Mm -hmm. And it starts a little tiny idea, and if it's a good one, if it's one I kind of like, it'll just flourish bigger and bigger, and pretty soon I've got so many of these things in my head, I've got to go and write them down right away. Mm -hmm. And so I have little scraps of paper all over my house, my office, my purse, everything, of notes. Wow. No, just only ideas. A couple moments later, but you just uh, moments to go. But you intrigue me with something. There. You have a family. You've got a husband and a child. Two, but Two one kids. doesn't live at home. One anymore. at home, um, and you're off in a room with a candle and writing all night. <laughs> How's the family? take to this? Well, they have learned not to bother me. They used to. Um, and sometimes if my daughter's in a uh, kind of a frisky mood, she will come in and want to talk to me and just bug me just so I can't write. <laughs> and she's dying to see what's on the screen. My husband does that too. He comes in to talk to me about something and he's really looking at the screen <laughs> to see what I've got on there. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, Connie, I know from uh, a conversation earlier that part of the element that you try and put into your writing is humor. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Why do you do that and how does that manifest in what you're writing? Well. I try to do it because I don't think, I don't enjoy a read that is just w on one level. All, all intensity and all tragedy can be just as boring to me <laughs> as completely surface stuff. You know, there has to be peaks and valleys and there has to be um, moments when you can step back out of the characters and, and, and laugh. And um, I think that the best books, which I'm trying to write, are books that uh, have a lot of different aspects to them, humor and, and the romance and the tragedy and the sexual intensity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. To the uninitiated, like me, I have never read a romance novel. What can you tell me or how can you entice me to read one or what, sh what book should I start with? Is there a good one or two that are out there? We all have our favorite writers. Mm -hmm. um, with heavens. I would, um, what, what do you like? Do you like adventure? Do you like history? Do you yes, know? both, yes. I'm going to recommend one of my favorite books. <laughs> <laughs> Which is Anne Maxwell's Diamond Tiger. I love that book. Right. <laughs> Anne Maxwell's Diamond Tiger. Well, you heard I'm it here on Artifacts. That's folks, right. Those of you need, okay, so Edith it really Lane. comes from it's Crimson Crown. Crown. Yeah. What Crimson was Crown. Crown. Crimson Crown by Edith Lane. Anything by Mary Jo Putney. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we're not even recommending local writers here. These right. are people, I don't even know well, these people. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just going to say down. thank you very much for joining us. I wish we could go on. I'd want to hear some more reading from each of you. Maybe we can do this in a future time. Anytime. Susan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Connie? Thank it's great you. to have you on there. Denise, thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you all. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, now, in a moment, we'll be back, uh, Janet will be back with a discussion about independent contractors and uh, some pioneering work uh, the local uh, movie industry is taking in terms of the IRS and all of that sort of thing. And later on, uh, the Global Arts uh, uh, Communication School up in Sheridan, and uh, we'll be talking about Japan Week. But before we, uh, before we get to all of that stuff, we want to roll a couple of clips for you from uh, Grumpy Old Men and Iron Will, two movies which were shot in Minnesota. And happily, right now, the last week in January, are sitting at in the top ten box office draws for movies across the country. Grumpy Old Men is number three, and Iron Will is number six. Very exciting. Here are the clips. something real bad you've got to go out where you can find it and grab it i want to feel alive i want to feel like dad's alive you was going to do this for me now let me do it for him we are here about a race a boy thrust into manhood ah oh, let them race you won't last through the first day i'll last as long as any man here including you mister 22 miles. This is the meanest stretch of land that God ever put together. Ten thousand dollars, Will. You don't have to die for it. I'll wait to five thousand dollars. He doesn't make heartbreak hell. <laughs> You've got one chance. You must run at night when the others have stopped. You ever had frostbite? You will. Your fingers and toes. They're gonna look like this. I'm not quitting. A challenge as deadly. <laughs> as nature's fury and man's greed. 
What's the matter, kid? You scared? A will as strong as iron. The kids in the lead. The whole country's rooting for you. Are you Will Stone? I'm the Will Stone. Boy, it's the heart of a bear. Yeah. Got to stop him. <laughs> you tried to kill my dog. In the classic tradition of Walt Disney Adventures comes the incredible story. Of a boy who faced his fears. Come near me or my team again, I'll kill you outright. And rallied a nation. It's Dolman. It's not possible. To believe. Atta boy, we'll give him something to talk about back home. In a dream. Iron Will. What's beautiful? This monster on my wall stuffed. Oh no. There can be no stuffing. This is a live creature full of courage and life. Nobody's gonna believe me. Oh. Let me get a camera. Oh no. But just hold Here it for the water Where is it? Batman. Here we go. Oh, wait, wait. Hold it. Here, hold it. Hold it. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Janet Zahn. Uh, about two years ago, the Twin Cities film and video industry was threatened with compliance reviews by the IRS regarding its use of independent contractors. This was a problem for the film and video industry. And with me here today to talk about the problem and how we worked at solving the problems are Lee Henderson from the uh, Minneapolis law firm of Hessian, Hessian Mackesy and Soderberg, and Jean Canton, who is a producer with Lee Pictures in town and is the president of the Minnesota Film and Video Association, which is the organization that was formed to deal with this issue specifically. Welcome. Thank you. Glad you guys Thank could you. Uh, come by this morning. Um, tell me, Jean, as a person who works in this industry, why was this a big problem that the IRS was uh, knocking on everybody's door? Well, I think it was a problem for a lot of reasons. Basically, it was going to change the way this industry did business uh, and the way they had been doing business for about 30 years. Um, it would, uh, reclassification, I think, would ultimately uh, cost producers more money. The administration side of, of the work would increase a lot more paperwork. Um, for people uh, with retirement plans, if they had to treat these people as employees, that would affect them. Mm -hmm. um, but I think probably the scariest thing for producers was the impending audit, um, being responsible for um, past taxes and penalties mm -hmm. uh, assigned to them if they had uh, misclassified mm -hmm. the people that they had hired. And generally the industry as a whole did not want to change how they were doing business. No, they didn't. I think the, the, the consensus in the industry was that they wanted to maintain the status quo mm -hmm. of how things had been done mm -hmm. for so long. So then how did the industry respond to this as, as the word got out and uh, they understood? Initially I think the response was major frustration. Um, <laughs> everyone felt uh, that it was totally unfair mm -hmm. and and, uh, and really, I think, was at a loss at what to do. And, but I think it, it very quickly turned around to people recognizing that organizing efforts would, would uh, be helpful. And it was because of that that a group of people from the industry got together and formed the Minnesota Film and Video Association. Mm -hmm. And that group um, uh, got organized very quickly, set up themselves as a 501c organizations so that um, donations could be tax deductible and they operated as kind of an information gathering and information disseminating organization 
um, tried to keep the, the industry abreast of what was going on, um, organized letter writing campaigns to legislators, mm -hmm. um, and, and then basically I think the turning point was that in response to a request by our organization to the local uh, IRS um, uh, division mm -hmm. to sit down with them and talk to them about why they were doing that, get their take on what was going on. Mm -hmm. We met with them locally and that really started the ball rolling in terms of us ultimately being at the table and we mm -hmm. being at the table in Washington with national IRS mm -hmm. decision makers. Well, Lee, as legal counsel for the Minnesota Film Video Association, you did represent them eventually in Washington, D.C. for all of these discussions that took place. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about where the IRS was when the whole process started. Sure. Uh, the IRS has historically looked at uh, people as a source of revenue for the federal government. We all have to pay our taxes. And they have generally accomplished that through a withholding system that allows employers or requires employers to withhold certain taxes and pay certain taxes on behalf of all the employees. Because of that, the government has long had a predisposition to make people employees rather than independent contractors. Uh, one of the benefits of this process is we have been able to undertake a new form of relationship with the IRS that hasn't previously existed. Historically, they would write regulations generally and then tell the world that that's what they were, or they would deal with the taxpayer in a particular setting mm -hmm. with a particular set of facts. Here we had the opportunity to go into the IRS, meet with them in advance of any guidelines being prepared, have an opportunity to educate them about the industry, tell them what we do, why we do it, why we think people fall into a particular category, and they were very receptive to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what led to the guidelines that we think are going to be issued. Why all of a sudden a big change? What, what prompted the IRS to uh, change their way of doing things? Not sure I can answer that completely. <laughs> um, the IRS undertook a program a few years ago called the Compliance 2000 program, mm -hmm. which was designed to become a little bit more user friendly with the taxpayers of the country. They recognize that uh, from a pure person standpoint, they don't have the resources to go out and audit everybody and make sure everybody's in compliance. So they're looking at this as an opportunity to make the regulations a little more user friendly mm -hmm. uh, so that the taxpayers can understand what the rules are and comply with them. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, which was about a year and a half long process, um, would you describe uh, your, uh, would you call this a success, this process, and, and if so, why? Yes, I would. I think it was actually an outstanding success for the industry because uh, we have gone through 18 months of education of the IRS. We have the IRS's commitment that they need to re-educate their own people so that they better understand this industry and how it operates so that when particular agents are out in the field looking at particular companies, they will understand a little bit better why the company operates the way it does and, and the importance of independent contractors in this industry. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the good part of it is for the industry that I think we now have a set of guidelines that upon final approval will allow an individual producer uh, or production company to be able to look at the common law test of what's an independent contractor and make some fairly simple, sound business judgments about whether the person he wants to hire should be treated as an independent contractor or as an employee. Mm -hmm. That's something that's never been available in the past since the rules were very complicated and very ambiguous. It was real difficult to figure out who fell into which camp. Mm -hmm. Gene, what does this mean for your business? You're pretty familiar with the new guidelines as they've, they've been uh, mm -hmm. negotiated. <coughs> Well, I think I would agree with what Lee said, that basically it is going to alleviate the ambiguity around what we were using before, which was the 20 common law factors. And, and the initial response by the industry was that they didn't understand these factors. And, and they said, you know, give us something concrete that we can understand and we will abide by those, those rules. Mm -hmm. And I think these guidelines are ultimately going to do that and ultimately going to el eliminate some of the paperwork that we've had to uh, initiate to try to, to document that what we were doing mm -hmm. was hiring independent contractors. It's just going to make it a lot more clear and let us know exactly how we should be treating each of the people that we do hire, subcontract with, or, or hire, depending on which classification they fall into. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is... Uh, Minnesota actually had, a, had a, played a very large role in all of these negotiations. There were a couple of other national organizations involved. The Association of Independent Commercial Producers, 
uh, which uh, represents the television commercial production industry, and then the National ITVA, International Television Association, which is primarily the corporate producers. Mm -hmm. And then here's Minnesota coming into this, this very complicated um, and really quite exciting process. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, really about Minnesota's role in all of this? Maybe Lee, you can address that. I think the, the thing that got Minnesota involved in this was the concern that was raised by the industry here after the audits were started uh, rattled the, the cages of a few people in the Internal Revenue Service and got their attention. Uh, at the time that we were doing this, there were other efforts that had already been undertaken by the AICP in New York. And the person in Washington who's in charge of this, Tony Warchalock, believed that if he was going to do this effectively and be able to come up with some guidelines that would work around the country, he needed some input outside of the New York, Los Angeles marketplaces, mm -hmm. which didn't always operate the same way that things operate in other markets. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Minnesota group was so well organized, he came out here and, and sat down with us and listened to us, and after hearing uh, what he heard about the industry here and how active it was, invited the Minnesota group to participate. It gave them the perspective of the non-East or West Coast mm -hmm. producer, and a lot of the corporate community, which they did not have at that point in time. Right. So by bringing Minnesota into the group, they rounded out the industry and made it more of a national process instead of one that was specifically designed for a particular segment mm -hmm. of the industry. So really, in the end, everybody's going to be a lot better off because Minnesota came in and joined oh, absolutely. in the fray, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I think so. Uh, tell us, Jean, what's on the docket for MFEA? What's going to be coming up next? Well, we have a couple of things planned. Um, we had a seminar uh, that introduced these new guidelines on last Monday night, and um, we had an overwhelming response. And so we're planning to give kind of an encore performance of that sometime in February. Um, the seminar was videotaped, and we plan to show the tape, and Lee has graciously offered to be there again to field another question and answer segment. Um, on April 15th, I love that we're doing that on that date, um, <laughs> we're, we're planning um, just kind of a fund, fun fundraiser. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be showing Mr. Smith goes to Washington, mm -hmm. at, and um, d just having it be kind of a fundraiser to help pay our debt mm -hmm. to Lee for <laughs> all the work that he's done. And then another real important thing, I think specifically important to producers in town, is that we are going to be developing a packet of information that will include these, um, by these guidelines, um, will help explain them, um, will include some sample contracts for producers to use that will help them determine mm -hmm. what classification the people that they hire will fall into, and then probably will include some examples so that they can better understand how this is all going to affect them. And if people want to find out more about these events and maybe even more about the issue and, and the progress that we've made, they can call the MFVA hotline at 822 6797. And before we go, we just have a little moment. Lee, is any, are there any other industries that are doing anything like this? We're the first, I know. We are the first. Uh, the, this industry is the first one in the country that the IRS has reached an agreement with. Um, there are four or five others that are in process, and they are looking at the opportunity to do this wherever the, they can because the IRS is clearly of a mindset right now that doing these things with industries is going to help resolve this independent contractor problem much better than individual audits will ever do. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, thank you both for coming, and congratulations on your work and your accomplishments. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, still to come, uh, Phil is going to be up uh, talking with the Arts Magnet folks, and he's bringing you a special scoop introduction to Japan Week. And the arts question, we still have the arts question and prize giveaway, and I guess that's about it. But that's a lot, so stay tuned.
And we're back. And as most of the viewers to Artifacts know, we're blessed with a great uh, tradition and a great array of art here in Minneapolis. And a very important part of that are the young people that are learning the arts and the schools that teach them and in general arts education. And I'm very excited, very pleased to have uh, with me now some guests from the Sheridan Global Arts and Communications School in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, one of the arts magnet schools in Minneapolis, and it's our intention artifacts to have other people uh, from the other arts magnet schools on the show in the future. But first, let me introduce Carrie Felt, who is the uh, principal at Sheridan, and Mary Jo Thompson, who's the fine arts coordinator, and Stacy Lawrence, who is uh, a student, but that hardly describes what she is. She's an artist, a writer, and I understand you sing and dance as well. What do you do? You like going to school at Sheridan? Yeah. Okay. What is it you like over there? subject is dance. Dance, okay. So you're not going to come and dance for us though, but you brought some artwork, is that right? <coughs> okay, we're going to take a look at uh, some of Stacy's uh, artwork in a bit, and she's also going to read to us uh, something that she wrote. But first, could, uh, Carrie, could you just describe a little bit, what is, for those who don't know, what is uh, the mission of the Sheridan School up in Northeast? Well, it's actually a threefold mission. It's global studies, focus on the arts, and communication. Um, we have uh, kindergarten through fifth grade currently, and eventually we will be a kindergarten through eighth grade uh, school. Okay, so you're adding a year. And I'd like to add that we are a Minneapolis public school. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Very successful one, as I understand it. Um, so in a sense, there should be commas after global and arts, and then, of course, the communications. Could you outline just very briefly what that means in each of those areas to the students and, and to the teachers as well? Mm -hmm. Uh, global studies, various global uh, countries that we've been studying in, in each of the grade levels. Um, we focus in on the arts, uh, visual art, uh, music, dance, uh, strings. Kindergartners even take strings at uh, Sheridan. Uh, communications is a focus in on the uh, computer and um, um, video. Okay. And obviously there's an interconnectedness there too. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the global perspective would relate very well, I would think, with uh, arts from around the world. And of course that computer, as we've tried talking about on this show a little bit, is increasingly becoming part of the art world as well. Exactly. And Mary Jo, you are the fine arts coordinator now. I can imagine what that is, but tell us, what does that mean? What do you do on a daily basis? Well, I was fortunate to come into the program as it was being created, and my job has been to kind of shepherd the creation of a new program in the Minneapolis Public Schools. So I'm the kind of curriculum specialist. I support the teachers as they design the curriculum and the assessments. Um, I work on grant writing and grant maintenance. We oh, have to do that. Yes, <laughs> yes. We've been very fortunate. We've been funded by federal magnet monies and state magnet monies in the arts to fund the program. That's an interesting thing. I think a lot of folks hear the term magnet. Um, and it's, it's an integral part of the Minneapolis school system. What is a magnet school? Um, <clears throat> basically, <clears throat> um, parents can choose programs that they feel would be best for their child. Okay, and is that what happened in your case? You knew that you particularly liked the arts or something that was up at Sheridan? Yeah. Yeah? So it was a choice. That's where you wanted to go. Do you live nearby or do you come from another part of town to get to Sheridan? Well, I live in northeast Minneapolis, so okay. it's not too far away from my house. Yeah, I suppose in the deep part of the winter, it can seem like a million miles away when you get the snow and the cold that we've had. Well, that's great. Before we go on and talk a little bit more about arts education as a subject, would you talk with us a little bit about some of the art you've brought? You were kind enough to bring many things, including what's up here in the easel. Can you just describe that for us and what well, you were doing there? I named it a color-changing strawberry woman because there's all of these colors around it, and the most of the colors around it are on the strawberry. Oh, I sure. And you mentioned before we started taping some of your favorite colors. Yeah. And what are those? Blue, purple, and black. And I see that right in these. Why don't you show us some of the other things that you've brought here? Well, I mean, our class made poems, and Mary Jo stuck them all in this book. <laughs> and it's a good thing she did too, isn't it? <laughs> and you're going to share with one of, one of them with us, aren't you? Okay. And I made this published book. Mary Jo came into our class and she helped us um, and make... What's, what's the title of this? You just went by it here. Best Friends. Okay. 
It's about me and my best friend, Amy, but right now she's in college at Florida. Okay, so you have a long distance friendship here. Yeah. Do you write to each other? Yeah. Has she seen the book? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's nice. Okay, what else did you bring here? You got at least one or two more uh, pieces of art you've done. Well, on Tuesday, <clears throat> we just made uh, these projects out of um, spaghetti noodles and gumdrops. And, our, well, first off, um, our group started out with a we tried to make a square building, but it just kept on falling and falling. So finally, we just thought, let's make a triangle. So we made a pyramid, and here's a picture that I made of it. Great. So it's kind of a little architectural attempt here to maybe redefine what we look at in buildings. Yeah. Great. And then we had to make self-portraits so ourselves. And this is mine. I guess. Mm -hmm. And w was this on the shirt you were wearing, the Paris, France, or do you intend to go to Paris, France sometime? Well, I had a shirt with this on, so mm -hmm. I just drew it. Well, that's great. Maybe in a moment you'll uh, read your, uh, your work for us, okay? okay great. Um, I feel lucky to have <coughs> professionals in the field here, and I wanted to ask, um, being an advocate of arts education in many parts of society, what's the current state of arts education in Minneapolis and maybe more broadly in, in Minnesota? I'll start with you, Mary Jo. Are we doing all right? Do we need to work um, harder in it, or what's up? I think we're st we always um, struggle against some assumptions the culture makes about what's hard and what's soft in the curriculum. Mm. And uh, we're very fortunate at Sheridan that we commonly believe the importance of the arts and learning. And we, our motto, our, our, our vision at, at Sheridan is that there are many languages of learning and that the arts are really um, languages for our, our students. Stacy is speaking in a visual language, in a verbal language. She speaks in the movement of dance. And she's becoming more and more articulate and more and more eloquent as a person. She's a great communicator. She's getting to be a better one. And we think that's really important in the world in which we are. These children, <coughs> Stacy's going to be 30 in, in 2024, I think. A third grader is going to be 30 years old yeah. in 2024. The world's going to be asking for good communicators, good flexible thinkers, creative thinkers. And we believe we prepare students very well by giving these many languages to them. We also, we forgot to mention, we teach Russian as a foreign language starting in mm -hmm. kindergarten at mm -hmm. Sheridan. So languages of learning, that's our so belief. Is do you know some Russian? Give me one word. We <laughs> uh, that. And uh, what does that mean? Grapes. Of course. <laughs> and it's your favorite color, right? Purple? You like that? Uh -huh. Now I know why. What's your take on the state? I mean, you're the principal, so you, you're in that tough position of being between limited resources coming towards the school and seeing what great benefit it can be. What, you know, to the students and to the staff. How, how is that as, as a principal? Well, I guess I'd like to say, first of all, that, that all schools in Minneapolis value the arts in some way or another. Um, there are two magnet schools in Minneapolis, Ramsey on the southern half, and we're on the northern half, and we draw uh, students from um, north of I-94 and Highway uh, 394. Um, we've been very blessed with many grants so mm. that we've been able to uh, really augment our program, in the, uh, especially in the arts and the communication. So we have many computers um, and really developing the communication uh, aspect for our students. But then also uh, we have um, been very blessed with, with uh, instruments and um, artists, guest artists to help us uh, develop our program. Uh, to best meet the needs of the students at Sheridan. And not incidentally, you're going through a major renovation up there too. We're in a three and a half million dollar renovation to uh, prepare the building to meet the program. So we're uh, yeah. creating a new theater, uh, we have a new dance studio, um, band, string suites, new uh, vocal music and art studio. That's great. We've got a couple minutes left and I would like to ask if you'd read your uh, story right now. Or your poem, I should say. Rainforest by Stacy. I went to the rainforest. I see a cheetah and a tiger. They are coming towards me. I'm a little scared. The tiger is dark orange with very dark black stripes like the night. They both look very friendly, like my mom. They want to come home with me. 
so I say, come here if you want me to love you and take care of you. So they come up to me, they, and they look happy like Disney World to see me. They start to lick my face. It smells like spicy perfume. I put the, a leash on the cheetah, and I put a strap on the tiger. And I put the cheetah on my lap because it's only a baby. And we ride all the way to the boat. We ride back to my house at 15 miles per hour. I bring the cheetah and the tiger to my humongous college in Florida because I live there. Some people are afraid, but I tell them that they are trained very, very, very good, and they will never bite or nip, and I love them like the sea. That was very nice. Thank you. That's great. When you grow up and you're 30 years old and whatever year Mary Jo said, do you want to do something in the arts? Do you want to dance or, or paint and draw or write? I think I would like to be an actress and a singer. Really? Good for you. That's great. A um, couple more things. You both are involved in CAP, which is an acronym for the Comprehensive Arts Planning Program. Can one of you just briefly describe what that is in the Minneapolis School District? Mm -hmm. uh, CAP is actually a program of the Minnesota Alliance of Arts Education. It's a, I think it's in its sixth round, and uh, it grants small amounts of money to school districts to look at long-range planning in the arts. So this year, Sher not Sheridan, but Minneapolis Public Schools has received this uh, grant and is working to develop a five-year plan for all across the district. What do we hope to see in the arts for children? Great. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to thank you all, Stacy, for coming and joining us with, with some of your art and your writing. Mary Jo, thanks. Carrie, appreciate you thank coming you down. Thank you for having us. Great. And uh, we'll, not, we'll be back in a moment taking a look at America Japan Week, but first we have the, uh, the uh, arts question. Well, that obviously was the art factoid, and happy birthday to the Minneapolis Arts Commission. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the arts question at the end of the show. In fact, we've got something special about our arts question. But I'm now pleased to introduce Kathleen Holland, who is the executive director of America Japan Week, which is an extravaganza that's going to be happening here in the Minneapolis area, uh, basically over the Memorial Day weekend. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you are executive director. Yes. And what does that mean you're in charge of? What is this Japan Week? Okay. Um, I'm in charge of the host committee organization, and we're in charge of volunteers, um, so American volunteers and Japanese-speaking volunteers. Are there enough of those here in the Twin Cities? We have to find 200. Oh, my word. <laughs> um, but we found 80 so far. We had our first orientation, and 80 people came, and then we're having another one in March, so we think we'll get enough people. Sounds like a big job in itself. And yeah. this is all to the end of bringing many, many Japanese artists and artisans and performers to town. Right. So who's coming? Um, we have uh, signed up. We got our first initial list from the Japanese organizers. So we have the National Martial Arts Federation. Uh, we have sumo wrestlers and judo and karate and um, aikido and all the martial arts coming. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Japan Kite Association. They're going to be doing the flying the giant kites. That's where numbers of people actually yeah. propel those along. It takes a lot of people to yeah. running very fast to get those off sure. the ground. Um, then we have, uh, let's see, Ibaraki is Minneapolis' sister city, mm -hmm. and they're bringing over about 70 people, and they're going to have a whole night at the State Theater that's Ibaraki Night that features nothing but songs and dances and music from Ibaraki. Okay, so many of the disciplines will be uh, exhibited here, singing, right. music, dance. Right. And are there crafts as well? Am I right in assuming that? Right. The crafts will be featured at the convention center. We have... Uh, calligraphy group coming, a flower arrangement group. Uh, we've got one group uh, that is school children, and they do goodwill paintings. It's sort of a gift from the children of Japan to the children of Minnesota. So they make paintings for us, and they'll be displaying their paintings well, at the convention center. That's a wonderful tie-in with the segment we just did on this show with uh -huh. one of our, our arts magnet schools, which has a global uh, focus on there. Right. Well, in just a moment, let's run a, a copy of a clip here that you were kind enough to bring us, just to give us a flavor of that. Okay. Um, why do the Japanese do this? Why are they coming to Minneapolis? 
Um, they want to do their part to make relations with Japan and other countries better. Uh, they know about Japan bashing, um, but they want to help improve the image of Japanese people in other countries. That They're not all these millionaires buying the Rockefeller Center. They're ordinary people. They're housewives, they're moms and dads and, um, and kids. And uh, it's just a group of caring people that they pay their own way to come here. And it's all volunteer. They're all volunteers. Right, and it's some of these people and, and artists that we're going to see in this clip. Yes. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this and then talk more about it. Okay. America Japan Week. That's a nice example there. So not necessarily those particular performers, but performers in those kind of fields will be here. Exactly. That's an example of what you would see when you come to a show at the State Theater. Mm -hmm. So every night you'll see about five different groups. They'll each perform for about 20 minutes. So you'll see drums, you'll see dance, you'll see performances on the traditional Japanese instruments. Right, a real variety show. Yes, That's and great. every night will be a different show. So you can come every night and see something new. That's great. And you are looking for volunteers. Yes. And what do you want these volunteers to do besides speak Japanese? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do need volunteers who, who just uh, speak English. Um, we're, we need people for ushers at State Theater. Um, we'll have a lot of people just passing out information at uh, when we do PV Plaza or the Convention Center. We've got thousands of school kids coming down to, to the convention center. So we need a lot of help keeping Okay, that so if somebody job. wanted to get involved, I believe you've got a number they can call? Yes. And right. you know that number by heart? Yes, it's 661-4755. Uh, okay, and we'll office. get that up on the screen. So if people want to volunteer for uh, America Japan Week, uh, who will they get? Probably find you on the other end of that phone or a answering yeah, machine? Yeah, me or an intern or an answering machine. So we're just asking them to leave their name and number. And uh, we have a lady who's in charge of our volunteers, and she's calling everybody back. Okay. Um, some of the things we just saw in there, and I know there are many, many other things that are going to be here. What are some of the crowd favorites? What do people love to see in Japan Week? Um, probably the number one most popular event is the martial arts because they bring the sumo. Okay, that sounds yeah. great. And most of it's going to be in downtown Minneapolis. Yes, yeah, State Theater, Target Center, Convention Center. And where else has Japan Week been? I understand this is an international thing. I mean, they didn't just say, oh, let's find Minneapolis. but Right. Each year, uh, American cities compete to see who gets to host this event. Um, in 1991, it was in Salt Lake City, Utah. 1992, it was in Portland, Oregon. And then it was in Phoenix, Arizona last year. Okay, and I think from something you said, they've, they've also been in Europe. And they still do Europe every year in the fall. Okay. So mm -hmm. if you were in Europe, you might find that particular city or this year, 1994, to be in Minneapolis. Exactly. Here. Well, that's great. Yeah. You said something interesting before we started the tape that um, you've essentially followed or, or preceded uh, Japan Week in helping to prepare that. You're kind of the advanced person, if uh -huh. you will. But that you've really um, turned on to the Twin Cities area. Yep. Yeah. What, uh, what are your plans? Well, we're looking for a way to stay here now. <laughs> really? We, we want to become Minnesotans, so. And, and this from a woman who actually went through that cold January uh -huh. we had here and the snow. So well, I'm an Oregonian originally, but it doesn't get to 70 below in Oregon. <laughs> um, no, we love it here. The people are really special. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Great. And uh, you're finding enough volunteers? I mean, people are starting to express some interest in this? Yeah, we've had a real good support. And I think once the word gets out, uh, it's going to be a tidal wave. 
Well, that's great. Kathleen, I want to thank you for being on. And uh, viewers of this show are going to find out a little bit more about uh, Japan Week as we get closer to it. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, in a minute, we're going to have Janet Zahn come back out and tell you a little bit about sort of a new wrinkle on a regular feature we've done here before, and that's the artifacts question. Um, but before we show you the question, before she comes out to explain that a little bit, if you've seen anything on the show or anybody that you'd like to know more about, uh, if you've had ideas uh, for segments or people you might want to see on the show, or just questions, call the City Cable 34 hotline, 673-2234, and our machine will be standing by and we can get back to you. So we'll be back in just a moment after the artifacts question. Now, if you think you know the answer to that uh, artifacts question, by all means, call the City Cable 34 hotline, 673-2234. And beginning with this uh, episode of Artifacts, the seventh caller with the correct answer is going to win a fabulous prize. In fact, it will be one of the books uh, that was talked about by one of our authors. So we're really excited about that. And Janet was going to, well, I think actually Janet got into one of Connie Brockway's books here. So... Uh, we're going to go back to last month's question, which had to do with Sir Tyrone Guthrie and why he wanted different colored seats in his new Minneapolis theater. And here's a caller with the correct answer. Hi, I'm, I'm answering the question regarding Tyrone Guthrie. He wanted the seats to be multicolored so that if the audience was not a full audience, it would still look like there was a full house. My name is Denise. And that was the correct answer on last month. So call in about this one. Now, we do want to mention, Janet, we do want to talk a little bit about next month's show. We're very excited. We're going to have, among other guests, Craig Dunn and some folks from the Very Special Arts Minnesota on to talk about a big project they're part of mm -hmm. before they go off to Brussels, an international event. And I am going to have a guest uh, that will be talking about the ITVA, Twin Cities ITVA Video Festival. This is their big event. It celebrates the best in corporate film and video production in the Twin Cities. Well, that's exciting, and all next time on Artifacts. I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. Thanks for watching. We'll see you. Okay, Phil, you've got to catch this. Look at